First Peter chapter three. It's right after James. We'll be in verse seven. Someone said, Husbands, do not call do not call your wives honey and act like vinegar. <clears throat> Oxymoron. Do you know a thirty second commercial in the Super Bowl is going to cost four million dollars? That's a lot of money. What I could do with four million dollars. When the Super Bowl started, a thirty second commercial was four thousand dollars. That's nothing. Do you know that a 30-second remark from you guys to your wife will cost you a lot? Be careful what you say. Be careful what comes out. Let it be seasoned with grace and mercy when you speak to your wife, to your loved one. Adam Clark said, How can a man expect his wife to be faithful to him if he's not faithful to her? You have to be faithful, guys, if you want your wife to be faithful. That's speaking of leadership. You take the lead. You be the example. That's a principle that you have to learn in in life itself. If you're a good leader in business, guess what? Your employees will follow you because you're a good leader. If you're a good leader in government, we will follow you because you're a good leader. Being a good leader is important. Your wife is looking for a good leader. Someone that they can follow behind because they know they have a heart for God And they have a heart to lead you in the right way. And you will follow them. But you must be a good leader. So if you are faithful, she'll be faithful to you. It's a principle that God has given to us. Warren Risby said, Husbands should live as though their wives were priceless porcelain vases. Treat them with gentle love. Guys, look at your wives as delicate vases. Or vases, whichever way you want to say it. They're delicate, they're precious, they're priceless, and you need to love them gently because they break real easy. Last week we looked at submission and how wives need to submit themselves unto their husbands. Virginia and I were were listening to a pastor on Calvary Chapel radio. He was a Calvary Chapel pastor who was busting us up because he was talking about submission. He made an observation. He said he thought that how interesting it was that wives struggle to submit to their husbands when they're trying to lead in a godly way. When they're leading according to Scripture and so forth. And they struggle with it and they're not submissive. But yet if their husbands lead in an ungodly way, in a pleasurable way, they quickly submit to that. You know, They actually win an award for being the best submissive wife ever. And there's so many like that. That when it comes to ungodliness, we can submit so easily to it, can it? All of us, even men, can submit to ungodliness so much easier than to God Himself. It's hard, and it's difficult. And we talked about submission, and this context is still in submission, because even the husbands are to be submitted unto God. We're to be submitted to the government, we're to be submitted to our employers, and we are to be submitted to God. And Jesus is the perfect example of that. He was submitted to the Father when He died on the cross for our sins. So let's go ahead and read verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Small verse, but there's a lot here, and we're going to break this up for you. Let me share this with you, because these are delicate subjects. I don't take them lightly, as I don't take the submission lightly of wives to their husbands. I don't want to give you my opinion. I want what the Word says and what God says. And so I study this stuff. I read about ten different commentaries and probably about four to six different uh, word studies, Greek studies, and lexicons. I look at the Greek and what the Greek says, and in fact I looked at the tenses of the Greek and what they intend to say and what tense they're saying it. Let me give you some examples uh, so that you understand what I'm saying, because the Greek language is different than the English language. I can say, I love you guys, and you guys all know what I mean, right? And you could say, well, I don't know you, I don't love you. (laughs) But get to know me, you'll love me. 
I can go to my wife and say, I love you, honey. And you know what I mean. And I can go to her pig and say, I love you, pig. <laughs> but see, we have the word love, and that's it. And we use it for different contexts, right? But we know what we mean. In the Greek language, it's different. It's more detailed. For you, I would say, I phileo you guys. That's brotherly fellowship love. That's how I'd say it in the Greek. My wife is agape, unconditional, no matter what she does to me. I love her unconditionally. To the pig, I don't know what kind of love that is. It's pig love. You know, you tolerate it. <laughs> you know, it's there. And it eats up the whole household. So the Greek is very detailed in its description. Now, it's tenses. What does it mean by tense? Well, for instance, salvation. There's different tenses of salvation. We have been saved, we are saved, and we will be saved. Three different tenses. So we have been saved in the past. There was a point where we accepted Jesus Christ into our lives. We made Him our Lord and Savior, and salvation was sealed, and we're going to heaven at that moment. That's the tense of salvation. We are being saved in that God is working those things out in our life, our flesh, culture, what we believe, what we think is right, all those things, and he's, in a sense, using the Word of God as a reverse osmosis. Every time we hear it, every time we read it, every time we study it, it's changing us. And so that's salvation, is that we're being saved. We're being prepared to when we are saved in the future. And that is when we die, and we're in the presence of God, and it's complete. So the tenses, I study all that. I've studied this stuff, so that I can present to you the truth of God's Word, so then you're challenged to, to believe it or not to believe what God has said. That's your choice. And when you stand before God, you'll be held accountable for that. Because you're going to hear the truth here today. And you have to make a choice to say, I believe it, I accept it, and I want to live by it. And that's on you. If you don't live by it, then you will struggle in life. Because God has written His Word to us that we have peace and rest in this world. Yeah, we'll have sufferings and persecutions, but we still can have peace and rest during those times. How's it working for you up to this point with your own wisdom and with the world's wisdom and psychologists and so forth? How's it working? Is there peace? Is there rest? Or is it still chaotic? So you get back to the Word of God, the simple Word of God, and, and just obey it. When, when it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband, just do it. You'll save a lot of problems. When it says, husbands, love your wives, just do it. It's clear, love your wife. Just do it. And a lot of problems would be solved. So let's look at this scripture again. Let me read to you from the Amplified Bible. It says, in the same way, you married men should live considerably with an intelligent recognition, honoring the woman as the weaker, but are joint heirs of the grace of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered and cut off. A little more descriptive there. Let's start with verse 7. Husbands. Husbands. Boy, that says a lot right there in the Greek. Husbands. There's a lot of suggestions and insinuations there. Husbands. Not just a man, not just an object, but a husband. One who cares, one who loves, one who's concerned, one that loves God and wants to direct and lead and guide in the right way. He's a husband, loves his children, loves to do what's right, <clears throat> loves respect, loves honor, loves all those great attributes. That's a husband. When you married your wife at that altar, you just didn't marry her. You loved her and that's why you were marrying her. Your intention was to live with her for the rest of her life, to lead and to guide her in this world, as a husband, one that she could trust and have faith and, and follow and be faithful to because she's also in love with you as you lead faithfully. The word husband in the Greek here is emphasized. It's emphasized by the Greek. In other words, it, it, it's putting more emphasis on husband than any other words because Peter's trying to say, you husbands, I'm talking to you right now. Wake up and listen to what I'm saying. That's the emphasis. And so he says, likewise, pay attention. And he says, treat your wives as precious, as a gift of God, to be treasured, to be adored. 
reassure her, protect her, love her with every tender provision being made to her as a weaker vessel. So husbands likewise. Now the word likewise is used here and we've seen it being used in verses 1 through 6 talking about submitting to the government likewise to your employer, likewise to your husbands and now husbands likewise. But notice that it doesn't say to your wives. Husbands submit to your wives likewise. It doesn't say that. So then who are they supposed to submit to? We'll get to that in a moment. Because they are to submit, not to their wives, but to God. And we'll see that. Nowhere will we find husbands submit to your wives. But you will find this. Love them, understand them, honor them as a weaker vessel. And we'll go through each one of those today. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Right, left in your Bibles. There's another portion of Scripture that you can read pertaining to marriage. And I want to show you that the Bible does not say, Husbands, submit to your wives. Now, there are some that teach that, by the way. There are pastors that teach that. That, that, that say, Husbands need to submit to their wives because their, their wives, you know, um, have great ideas. They're intelligent and so forth. And I don't deny that at all. But that's not what Scripture says when you read the context. Look at verse 21. This is where they get it from. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then it says, wife submitting to your own husband. So they immediately go, "Uh uh-huh, see? It says you're supposed to submit to one another. You see? And so it's not saying wives just submit to your husband. Submit to one another. That's not what it's saying here. Again, you've got to look at the Greek and its context. Go back to verse 18. Listen to what Paul says. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation, but be filled with the what? Spirit. There's a spirit. This is the Trinity. The Holy Spirit. You're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to explain that, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of who? God. Who are they supposed to be submitting to? God, in the fear of God. Who both are to submit to God. So husbands are to submit to God and wives are to submit to God. And then Paul goes on and says, but wives, you have an extra submitting to do and that is submitting to your husbands. And by the way, submitting to your husbands means that you're submitting to God because God has asked you to submit to your husbands. Right? So husbands are to submit to the Holy Spirit. So they are to be in prayer They are to be reading, they are to be understanding their wives, and they are to be submitting to the Holy Spirit's leading to lead that family in a godly way, in righteousness. And I think, wives, you should hold them to that. There's nothing wrong with you saying, lead godly. I'll follow you, baby. I'll follow you, but lead godly. Yeah, you'll make mistakes, but I'm, I'm there for you. I'll pick you up. I'll lift you up. Just lead godly. And when you lead godly, when they see you reading, when they see you praying, when they see you studying, then they know you you have the right heart. You have the right heart. Don't misread their hearts. See, your husbands didn't marry you because they hated you. They married you because they loved you. They may not know how to express that love, but it's because they loved you, or they liked you at least, if not hated you. See, hate is a harsh word. We really don't hate. We use that word a lot, don't we? Hate. God said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder, because that's the next step is murder. See, hatred means that you despise a person. You can't stand the person. You don't even want to see the person. Uh, In fact, you're going to cause harm to that person if they're in your way. That's what hate is all about. That's the hate that the Bible talks about. We don't hate like that. We use the word hate because we don't have another word. Maybe, Maybe a better word would be, I dislike what they do. That's a better word. We, we do that, definitely. There's a lot of things I dislike that people are doing. You know? But I don't hate them. I dislike what the homosexual movement is all about. I dislike it. I don't hate them. God doesn't hate them. He loves them. 
wants to see them corrected. But we don't hate. Your husband doesn't hate you. If he hated you, he would have left you a long time ago. If he hated you, he would be killing you. It would be the next step. You know if he hates you, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you see him over your body with a knife. Uh, then, yeah, worry. <laughs> and worry at that moment. But he married you because he loved you. Help him to lead you and guide you. Get him involved in spiritual things. And so he is to listen to the Holy Spirit. He is to be submitted likewise to the Holy Spirit. And as God would lead him and guide him, he would follow God. In other words, he would be in control by God in its mission. So husbands likewise, and then he says, dwell with them with understanding. Woo! Understanding. Now that's interesting. I've been married for 34 years. Met my wife at the age of 13. Had our first son at 15, 16. Had all of them by the time I was 22. <laughs> I've got six granddaughters and one grandson. And I'm still trying to figure out my wife. <laughs> you think by now I, I would know you know, a lot more, but there's still so much that I don't understand. I understand a lot. And God is telling us to understand our wives. And as the husband, we need to understand our wives. We need to spend time with our wives. We need to communicate with our wives. They say that the average husband spends about 37 minutes with their wives a week. 37 minutes. You're here listening to me for 45 minutes, twice a week. If you come on Wednesdays, three times a week. But yet, 37 minutes, you communicate the whole week with your wife or with your husband. We need more communication. Really, communication is the key to understanding. We really need to communicate. Now, men, understand, men don't like talking. They're very ABC, generally speaking. They get to the point, how was work? Work was fine. Now, you ask a woman, how was work? Work, wow, I met so-and-so, we did... The, and then we went over... And you're going, oh, I said, was, how was work? You know, They can communicate. We have to be better listeners to understand them. They're amazing. Women are amazing when it comes to communication. And they really do want to talk to you. But you have to listen, and you have to talk too. You have to butt in somehow. We went to Corky's on last Wednesday, usually Wednesday nights after service. We'll just invite the body. Let's go to Corky's. And we try to get a big old crowd over there and witness and be an example. <clears throat> so we were there at Corky's. And Javier and Dora were over here on, on one side. And then um, Rosalind and Roman were here in the middle. And Moses was off to the other side. And Virginia's talking to, to Dora and Javier, and then all of a sudden Roman says something, she says something to Roman, and then Moses says something, he, she says something to, to Moses. Next thing you know, she's got three conversations going on at the same time. And I'm sitting there looking at this. I'm like, how do you do that? She goes, what? I go, you're talking to them in this deep conversation, and you're answering him and them, and then you're also answering, how do you have three conversations at once? I'm like, I have no idea how you do that. That is amazing. They just do. They really like to express themselves. They like to get in details and use flowery adjectives, you know, and so forth, you know, to describe things. That's just the way that they are. Know your spouse. Know them. Know them. And the only way to know them is to communicate with them. See, now I have an advantage because I met her at age 13. And so at that age, you know, you're kids and you don't know better. You just talk about everything. And we learned a lot about each other at that age. I mean, we know all the secrets. You know, we know what makes us tick and so forth. You know, the challenge is here we are 34 years later. What do we talk about now? You already know. There are a few things I forget. Really, when that happened? Tell me again. What was it? You know, or if I forget about myself. Do you remember when I did? She goes, oh, yeah. And she'll go off and tell me the whole story. <laughs> she knows my story more than I know my story. What do we talk about now? We talk about ministry. We went to a conference, as I said, engage, how to engage our culture and political, and she loves that stuff more so than I do. And um, we just communicate about Scripture, what Scripture means. We started talking about this adoring thing, you know, and, and so we got into a little debate um, <clears throat> over it, you know. She was like, no, nah, it's not saying that you have to, you know, put makeup on. I go, no, it's not saying that you don't have to either. 
You know, I studied the Greek. I actually went into it. I shared it last week with them. And if you were in service, you would have... No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, just, we just start talking about it. And we start talking about church. And we start talking about ministry and so forth. You know, those are the things we communicate one with another. There's always something to communicate on. My point is, is that if you want to know your wife, husbands, you need to communicate with them. You need to sit down and, and figure out what makes them tick because they're very talented. There are things you don't know about them. Let me read to you what uh, Ray Pitchford writes in his commentary. In the, King, in the King James Version calls the husbands to live with their wives according to knowledge or understanding. Understand them. Get knowledge about them is what he's saying. That's a good thing way to put it. Know your wife. Study her. Study her. Just watch how she does things. And you don't even have to communicate. Just watching her. Watching how she responds to the kids. Watching how she responds to certain things. And so forth. You know, watching her. Learning from that. Study her. Get to know her. What makes her tick. Figure out how her mind works. That's hard. That's hard to do, because her mind's all over the place, you know, and it's very emotional, and the mood swings are here, then there, and here, and then, you know, on top of that, when you hit that age of 50, and, and the life-changing experience comes in, boy, I would tell her, she's like, I'm, I'm getting near that age, I'm like, yeah, so how does this affect me? I would tell her that, you know. And I'm like, I need to get myself ready for this. She goes, yeah, there you go. You're always thinking of yourself. Well, it's going to affect me, right? Am I right? <laughs> I just need to know how to prepare myself. You know? And how does it affect you? You know, the, the chills at night. And, Did you turn the heater on? No, I didn't turn the heater on. You want me to go turn it off? I'll make sure it's off. You know, just all those things. Get to know them. What makes them tick? What's working on in their minds? The changes in their, their ages and so forth. Uh, learn what their gifts are. Their desires, their talents, their hopes, their dreams, because all of them are talented in one thing or another. And then encourage that. Encourage that. My wife is very talented. Very talented. She can draw. She can play music. She can make crafts. She can think of all kinds of businesses that she's thought of. She hasn't fulfilled any of them yet, but hopefully she will one day. You know. But just very talented. Love kids. Can get kids motivated. Teaching kids. She led worship here. She teaches the kids here. She does this women's ministry. She takes care of the political stuff. We need people to help her that are just as talented, that want to get involved too, and be godly women like, like she is. And she is a great example to follow. You know? And I don't say that lightly because she is, as many of you are. You know? How do you encourage those gifts, man? You need to encourage those gifts. Go do that. You have that talent. Go do it. Go do it, husbands. Peter goes on, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. The word giving in the Greek means to portion off. To portion off that honor. In other words, you know how to distribute it to her. <clears throat> There's those times when she's down and you need to lift her up. And so you just give her what she needs at that moment to lift her up. The honor... Actually, the Greek word is not honor, but precious. And Peter has used that word. We've noticed that. Precious, precious, precious. Your wife is precious. She's precious in the eyes of the Lord. Guys, you have to agree with God. You have to agree with God in your head and say, my wife is precious. If he thinks that she's precious, then I think that she's precious. Thus, she is precious. And she's precious to me. And that means respect. Respect respecting your wife. Same word in verse 19 of chapter 1. So you are to give honor to your wife. The wife suggests that you're married. Let me just say this. Scripture is clear. You need to be married. If you're not married and you're living together, you need to get married. And you need to trust God. That He'll take care of you through that. You can't do that because God isn't going to bless that. It's a hindrance. God wants to bless. He wants to pour everything He has into you. But you're hindering Him because you're not following Scripture. Biblical principles. It's a wife that He's talking about here. And then she's a weaker vessel. The Greek speaks of the body's strength. Your wife is a weaker vessel. A weaker person of humanity. God created man to till the garden. And then God created woman to give birth. 
she's weaker in body, in frame, and so forth. And that's a physical truth, right? Men are stronger than women physically. Now, there's some women, I, I understand, there's always an exception. You know, There's some women you don't want to mess with because she'll beat you up. You know, they're just they're just strong that way, you know. And they just have that strength, you know. But generally speaking, not all women are strong like that. Women are weaker vessels. Their their bones are weaker. The immune system's weaker. There's just a lot of weakness about them, and that's all it's saying. So that's why uh, Peter is saying that, so that we understand they're precious and they're delicate, and so you need to treat them that way. The word vessel is interesting. Because we're just thinking of a vase or some sort of container. And some of you guys might even thinking of one of those spitting things. Where you just spit into it. And that's far from the truth. That vessel is speaking of a vessel that's in the temple of God. A vessel that's in the temple of God used for God's service. is sanctified and set apart for the use of God. And so your wives are a weak vessel being used by God. For a special service. And you have to understand that again. And you need to somehow <coughs> help her to fulfill what God has created her for in this world as that weaker vessel. This was radical teaching for Peter at the time. The commentaries that I were reading were, were talking about the culture at the time and how they treated women. They didn't have any rights. Women had no rights. The Romans were even worse. Do you know that if a Roman male was caught in the act of adultery, the woman didn't say a word. She couldn't say a word. She had no rights to it. But you know if a Roman caught his wife in the act of adultery, he could kill her right on the spot. Right on the spot. Boom. Put a dagger through her. Done. It's over. Give me a next wife. You know, they had no rights. And so Peter's talking to these husbands, and they're going, what are you talking about, Peter? You know, this doesn't make any sense. But Peter's relating the relationship of Christ to the church. Remember that. It's a mystery. Our marriages reflect that mystery of Christ in the church. And Christ loved the church. And Peter wanted to get that across to the husbands, that you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. <clears throat> Let's turn to Ephesians 5 again, if you haven't turn back. Um, I, I want you to see what Paul says as we continue to read on in that chapter that we went to earlier and what Paul says. And, and the reason is is because you get the idea that the Holy Spirit is writing this and not just men. It, it's God dictating men what to put down. And the truth that truth doesn't change. And so as we read earlier, verse 21, submitting to one another with fear of God, the context there in the commentaries that I've read in the Greek is saying that both husband and wives are to submit to God. And then the added role is that wives is to submit to their husbands, not husbands to their wives. So he says in verse 22, Paul, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And he qualifies that, and we'll see that in a minute, in everything, verse 24. So, you're to be submissive. Very clear. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now, why is he the head? God gave him that role. Paul tells us in Timothy, the reason is because the woman was tempted and gave in. So God put man as the head of the wife. That's part of the repercussion. <clears throat> For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject or submitted to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So just like the church, we as the church are all submitted to God. Right? We're all submitted to God and to His truth. And we're to follow that truth. Husbands, love your wives. Verse 25, <clears throat> Paul says, <clears throat> Just... As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, it's so easy to say, well, I know how he loved the church. He died for the church. He suffered for the church. You know, he was mocked for the church. You see, I understand that. Well, then live it. Suffer for them. Endure the hardships. 
If it means that you have to sacrifice, then sacrifice. Crucify if have to. To reflect that relationship between Christ and the church. That He may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the word by washing of water by the word, that he may he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. And then verse twenty eight, and that's where I want to touch on again. Verse twenty eight to husbands. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Guys, you love yourselves and you're to love your wives as you love yourself. Now, we all love ourselves. In fact, look at verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as the Lord does the church. So husbands, because you don't hate yourself, you love yourself, you nourish and you cherish yourself, so you need to nourish and cherish your wife also like Christ did. And that's a commandment, by the way, for you to do. For we are the members of His body and His flesh and of His bones. So, the responsibility of the husbands is important, isn't it? You can turn back to Peter. Very important for us to follow these commandments of God. Can I say this? And I said it with the ladies. There is a lot of pressure on men in our culture. There they are attacked on every side by the enemy. He does not like marriage, and we see that in our culture today, breaking up the traditional marriage, the whole foundation between a man and a woman, and taking away the rights of men, even in our culture today, and I think it's satanic, taking the rights of husbands, uh, making them feel less than a woman. And that's happening in the commercials, where women are now the heroes. Women are stronger than men. They're saving the world and men are stupid and dumb and can't even do anything. And you see that taking place and women are believing it. And that's a lie of the enemy. We have roles to play and we need to play the roles that God has given to us so that our marriage reflect Christ in the church. And husbands are under attack and you should be concerned about that. You should have enough love to respect them and honor them and encourage them and strengthen them. Because it's it's not at work with their friends that don't believe and are telling off jokes and all the other garbage. And if it's not with their fellow men employees, it's with their women employees that want to befriend them for whatever reasons. We need to be aware of those things. I remember uh, years ago, I was going through a lot of pain and... I was just trying to find comfort anywhere I could find it with my hip and so forth. And there was this one uh, Christian lady, beautiful lady. Uh, she just loved the Lord and uh, she would pray for me. She'd come to our house and pray too and just friends with someone. And um, and I found myself, she would call me, see how I was doing and so forth and things like that. And she'd pray for me again. And it was just purely spiritual and so forth. But then my wife said, why is she always calling you? What is going on here? I said, nothing's going on. I'm just trying to get better, you know. She goes, well, I don't like it. And so from that point on, I stopped it because she didn't like it. You have to be aware of those things because they're attacks on your character and your leadership. And you can't allow them to continue. It, well, how did you stop it? Did you go tell? No, I just stopped. You know, when there was a call, I didn't answer it, you know. And if she got you, you just you know, say, okay, yeah, real quick, boom. But eventually they understand you're trying to distance yourself. You know, then they just stop calling. But you have to be aware of those things. Understand what affects your relationships. Important stuff in order for your relationships to thrive. And then he goes on, Peter, you can turn back to Peter. And as being heirs together of the grace, now he says of life. Now we all are under... God's grace, we've all been saved through grace, through faith, and it's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. And we get to enjoy that grace together because God has given it to all men and women. But there's a grace in life, favor in life itself, and we are heirs to that favor of God as a couple. God has given us that favor. Don't think, guys, that you're it, because they're it too. And you're working together as a team. 
to fulfill God's calling in your life as a couple. I don't believe God calls the man and then calls the woman to just stay at home and do something else. I believe God calls both of them into the ministry. Calls both of them into a ministry or into Christianity to serve together, to not serve separately. The same grace and we are heirs. That is, we are going to receive our rewards when we get to heaven based upon our faithfulness to God and His Word. And by the way, it's based upon faithfulness, not based upon how much He gives you or what status you have or what place you have in life. It's based upon your faithfulness with what He has given to you completely. So if you have a big church and you're doing great things like Chino Hills, and they pretty much turned AB 66 over. They're the ones that stopped it. Big church. We were a part of it. We took our, you know, whatever, 100 petitions, and we took them over there, and we put them in there. But would that have stopped it? No, because we needed like over 5,000. We could only give 100 or so from this church. So we couldn't have stopped it. But when we stand before God, God isn't going to look at that. God is going to look at, were you faithful with what I've given to you? And we were. We presented it to the body, and the body responded, and they signed. If you didn't sign, then you weren't faithful. God will hold you accountable to that. We need to be faithful with what God has given to us. If you have a wife, be faithful to her, or your husband, or your children. Be faithful with what God has given you and your family. Not all of us are rich. If you're rich, you have a certain responsibility. Be faithful to that. If you're poor, you have a responsibility. Be faithful to that, to live for God. And God is going to reward you. Remember I said last week, That when we came into this world, we came into this world single. When we leave this world, we're going to leave this world single. We won't be married in heaven. There will be no more marriage. And so the only time we have together is now in this world, working out our salvation. So we have to be faithful with this. And then when we get to heaven, God will reward us for our faithfulness. So understand that they are joint partners in the honor of representing Christ in the church. If he does not recognize the equality and that they're joint partners, then guess what happens? Look at the next statement, that your prayers may not be hindered or interrupted. Hindered, interrupted. If you're not submitted to the Holy Spirit in your leading as husbands, your prayers aren't going anywhere. God has interrupted them until you get that right before God. It's the same principle that Jesus said when he says, when you come to the altar to give me your gifts, that is your offerings and your tithes, and if you have a problem with your brother, he says, don't even bring me the gift. Just leave your gift there, go get right, and then come back and give me your gift. You have to get your heart right first before you offer me anything. In other words, I'm not accepting the gift until your heart is right. And so here, you can pray all you want, All you want, but if you're wrong with your wife or there's odd in your wife and you haven't taken care of it, then I'm not listening to you until you go take care of that. We teach that to our kids, don't we? Go get right first. Go do this first before, you know, they'll come and they'll, but but I want to, no, go take care of that and then I'll listen to you. Yeah, but you don't, no, just go do it and then come back. We're teaching them that principle. Make sure that you take care of things and not let them go because then your prayers are interrupted. That's sad that you can be a man of God and be deceived, be deceived, thinking that God hears you. When He's not, He's interrupted that prayer until you get right with God. Uh, David uh, Guzik said, Peter's assumption that the fear of hindering prayer would motivate Christians' husbands to love and to care for their wives. And they should. And this is what he's assuming. That if you're fearful of losing that connection with God, then you'll start treating your wives correctly. But a great observation, we notice that a lot of men don't even pray, so they're not concerned. Well, what do you mean? I don't pray anyway, so why am I concerned? Men, you have to be men of prayer. You have to be praying to the Lord on a regular basis. If you take time in the morning or afternoon, whatever it is, or you pray without ceasing, as Paul said, but you need to be men that pray to God asking for directions and insights and understanding, no matter what. Seeking God first for everything. Let me close. Husbands, 
Listen up. It's a great responsibility. And it is a difficult one, just as it is for a woman. And it is hard to lead, especially when you are misunderstood. Especially when you know your own heart and that you're trying to do the right thing, and yet it's not taken as the right thing. Be encouraged. This is where you have to live, by faith, knowing that God knows. God knows. And so you just be faithful with what God has told you and continue to lead in that manner. And either they will follow or they will not. Let me tell you a quick story. When Raul Reese got saved, God called him to the ministry. His wife, who was the daughter of a missionary, was praying for Raul for years as they were married. <clears throat> and he wanted Raul saved so their marriage would be better because Raul was bad, abusive. And she wanted it better by him being safe. It'll get better. Well, she didn't want him to go into ministry, though, because she'd been in ministry all her childhood and saw the ministry and how difficult and hard it was. And so she's like, no, I don't want you in ministry. So she opposed Raul, in a sense, to pursue ministry. And Raul said, God called me, and I'd rather obey God than man. So Raul told his wife, there's the door. If you want to leave, go ahead and leave, but I'm going to follow God. You know what she did? She followed him. Be faithful to God, and if they are faithful to God, they're going to follow you. They're going to follow you. You just be faithful to God, knowing that God has called you, if He has called you. Treat your wife as precious, a gift from God, to be treasured, reassured, protected, and loved, with every tender provision made for her. You can't. You must not be harsh or resent your wives. And lastly, know this. Your wife is not your child. She's not your child, that she should obey you like a child. She is your sister in the Lord. And you are to honor her as a weaker vessel and understand her. She's a gift from God given to you. Let's pray.